In, in Islamic ethics and theology, there's a distinction between committing a, a, a moral sin that that is only um, a sin against God and harming a person, harming a human being, committing a sin of um, violence or aggression against a human being. You know, it's possible for God to forgive us for, for anything um, in, in God's ultimate grace and mercy. Um, and, and if it's between us and God, that's, that's enough, uh, that personal confession. But when we've actually harmed another human being, when we violated their rights, their property, their person, their honor, their dignity, true repentance is demonstrated by asking forgiveness of that person, um, if possible, repairing the harm or making an attempt to repair the harm or to help make that person whole because of the damage that has been caused and making a firm commitment to never doing that again. Um, without those actions, um, it is questionable whether we're truly committed to leaving behind this practice. The Hebrew word for repentance is tshuva, which literally means to return. In order for us to repent, to heal the world and ask for forgiveness, we have to look back on what we've done, to acknowledge it, to ask the other person for forgiveness, and then, only then can we have repented. Pope John Paul II, on the first day of Lent, he and the members of the, of the uh, Roman Curia, his staff, got together, uh, and in St. Peter's, they asked God's forgiveness for sins committed over the centuries, which included uh, coercion in matters of religion, which included torture by groups like the Inquisition. So he was very clear that this was something that he wanted to model and that the church itself should ask forgiveness of God and of those that it defended and then be reconciled to those with whom we were parted because of that. There's the famous quote by Abraham Joshua Heschel that some are guilty but all are responsible. And I think that cuts to the heart of the Jewish view of collective responsibility for sins. Um, that we all are aware of things that happen and we all have a role in fixing them and confessing for them. So on Yom Kippur, we confess publicly and in the plural. And I've asked people, why is it do you think that Jews confess in the plural, that we stand together and confess our sins, we actually beat our chests when we list off the list of sins that we have all done? And partly it's so that the individual doesn't feel embarrassed, but also it's an awareness that the individual has, has erred because the community has a responsibility for what they've done and as a community we have an obligation to, to repair the world. Um, most Jewish prayers are rich, written in the plural, but I think with the confessional prayers it has a real power. We're in this together and we have a responsibility for each other. You know, holding people accountable for wrongdoing means that uh, they may have to suffer the consequences in certain ways. And it's partly uh, <clears throat> as a matter of deterrence and creating uh, a logic of incentives so that people will not uh, continue to engage in wrongdoing uh, and that they will have the example before them of somebody who was prosecuted and, and sent to, to prison. But if there are no consequences, and if accountability isn't worked out in that way, then uh, it's a moral certainty that the practices will continue. After 9-11, the Bush administration, through Vice President Cheney, told the American people that we were going to have to go to the dark side in order to respond to the terrorists. Little did we know that the dark side included the use of torture. Torture has been illegal in the United States for decades. It is, has been illegal internationally, and it is morally corrupt, and it corrupts the soul of our country. But that is what the Bush administration decided to use as an interrogation technique. One of the uh, systems that they used was a, a system called waterboarding, where you make a person believe that they're drowning. And we used it repeatedly on a number of the detainees. And it's a technique that has been deemed torture going back as far as the Spanish Inquisition. We used shackling in stress positions, which put people hanging in with their hands above their heads in cold rooms naked for hours and maybe days. You know, right now in America, there are thousands of veterans of, the, of recent wars, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Many of them are dealing with the trauma 
of having committed violence, of having not only committed violence that was sanctioned, but in the context of that war, having done things that they themselves are ashamed of. You know, and these are, you know, when you look at that hurt, when you look at that pain, when you look at the kind of addictions and depression that many of our veterans have, um, and when they talk about, about what they did, about how much of, of their illness, their sickness, their spiritual sickness comes from bad actions they did, then we wonder what is the deeper effect of something like torture that is premeditated, deliberate, uh, persistent, consistent. Uh, what is happening to all of those people who witnessed that, who were, who were involved in that, and how does that affect their families and their neighbors and, and the rest of society? So the ramifications of something that is so evil um, are never limited, you know, to the, to the small dark rooms where these things are, occurred. Quite frankly, we as a nation need to repent of this. And repentance is confessing it. And part of confessing it is owning up to it. Jewish tradition believes that every human being was created in God's image. And so it's a desecration of God's image to torture them. And it's part of our American values as well that everyone has infinite worth. The fact that we tortured people as a nation means we've lost our moral standing on those issues. We've said, we've denied that sacredness in every human being, and I think it's created a real generation of moral failing. I think kids today think that it's okay to torture somebody else, that that's actually what heroes do to keep ourselves safe. But we've lost our own values. We've lost the moral compass. People say to me, well, Al-Qaeda is willing to torture people. Shouldn't we be willing to do the same? And I think it says something tremendously horrible about us as a nation if Al-Qaeda is guiding the moral conversation. Still Americans feel insecure after 9-11. We're concerned about our safety. And there's a fear that by, by investigating um, these events that we somehow are going to make ourselves more vulnerable to more criticism, more vulnerable to our enemies who will use this information to um, to attack us. Uh, but what people have to understand is this information is already widely available. Um, we may not see much of it in the U.S. news, in the newspapers, and, and on TV here, but it is widely available in the rest of the world. There are many graphic photos that Americans haven't seen that people in Egypt and Pakistan and, and other places have seen. So there's no hiding this. There also has to be a national confession. And quite frankly, if the United States doesn't repent of its sin of torture, of doing this to people, abusing them, treating them as objects, then I think our collective national soul will suffer. The National Religious Campaign Against Torture has issued a statement calling for a commission of inquiry in order to address the issue of accountability with respect to the use of torture by the United States. This statement can be found on our website, www.nearcat.org, and we urge everyone to go online and sign that statement. It is a statement we are delivering to President Obama, who has said he does not want to look back, he does not want a commission of inquiry, he just wants to look forward. But the president is wrong. We cannot go forward unless we have a full-blown commission of inquiry to look at what we did during these very, very dark days after 9-11. We ask you to go to your congregation and talk about this issue and the need for a commission of inquiry. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to talk about torture. We wish that it had never happened, but it did. And we cannot go forward unless we have a commission of inquiry. We have on our website tools that you can use to talk with your congregation. We have workshop ideas and we have videos that you can use. It's important to talk to as many people as possible, particularly people of faith, to make them realize how important it is for accountability with respect to the use of U.S.-sponsored torture.